Good and welcome. I'm Dorothy Cummings. I'm leading tonight's CDNY program, which is Country Dance Lore. Our speaker tonight is Danny Walkowitz, and he's going to talk to us about Dirty Dancing Not, and more on that when we get to his, uh, when I introduce him completely. Right now, I'm going to go over the, the house rules and the format. Uh, we're doing the announcements. Um, the presentation will go a bit over half an hour. We'll probably get started early. And we'll start Q&A 810, 815. We'll have some time for socializing after. And the length of socializing depends on how chatty people are feeling, like the Q&A. We are recording this session and it is live streaming to Facebook. Uh, we will post the recording at this link, which you can grab from cdny.org. If you don't wish to be live streamed or, uh, you know, or seen, uh, and recorded, then go ahead and turn off the video with this, uh, what do you call it, icon. Um, oh, am I muted? No, I'm not muted. And then uh, stop video if you want to not be seen. Um, it it uh, helps you with your internet connections as well. We ask you to remain muted during the presentation. Um, we do want your questions though. So please type them into the chat box and Helen is going to be collecting them here on Zoom and uh, Jeff will be collecting them on Facebook so that we can pose them to Danny at the end. But let's go on to what is happening in upcoming CDMY events. Um, oh, uh, tomorrow night, tomorrow night, we have a virtual concert, The Sound of Five Harps, and that is Tomoko Sugawara on harp. And for at least one of those tunes, she's being accompanied by Lisa Terry, the viola de gambist. Um, be sure to tune in for that. Next week, a week from tonight at 7.30, there is CDNY Live Flute Fest. Uh, it's hosted by Cynthia Shaw as usual, and we have an abundance of flutists. We have Zara Lawler, Helen White, who's here tonight, and Dominique Gagne. And then uh, our next lore event is on Thursday, April 1st, and that's Country Dance Lore with Daniel Popovich. So a little more on that. Daniel, um, that's going to happen on Thursday, April 1st, 7.30, and he's doing a follow-up on the music theory program. It's a part two, and uh, he'll be looking at how time signature affects our movement and answering questions that came up in the last time. Um, also, it is April Fool's Day. Um, Daniel, would you like to say a word or two about the talk you are going to give to us? <clears throat> well, not about April Fool's Day. You'll have to wait on, uh, for to see then, but um, yeah, so if you, this is going to be a continuation from part one. So if you didn't attend part one or fell asleep during it, uh, you might want to go and find the video uh, online uh, and, uh, and catch up. That's your homework between now and uh, two weeks from today. But I will be um, moving very quickly through the theory things I covered in part one and moving on to answering those questions that came up. Thank you, Daniel. So for those who have that homework to do, um, you can go there. We have a YouTube channel for the lore uh, the recordings and that uh, that YouTube site. I'm hoping we can post it in the chat, but it is definitely in the email that you received announcing this. And I believe that I've stuck it into the calendar as well, but I'm going to check. No, that I'll, I'll post it in the chat. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Jeff. Um, if you have any feedback, please send it to me at englishprogram at cdny.org. And if you wish, you can make a donation to CDNY at cdny.org forward slash give. I would like to thank my, uh, my team tonight. Um, Jeff Berry, thank you for running Zoom controls and live streaming to Facebook and collecting all those questions. Helen, thanks for running the door. And I'm Dorothy Cummings, that you are hearing talk a lot. Um, but that soon will change because I'm going to hand it over to our speaker, Danny Walkowitz, for Dirty Dancing Not, Turn of the Century New York, and the coming of the Sharpies. Now, Danny, um, I keep talking about this in case people don't know, uh, is a historian. He's the writer of City Folk, which is about the English country dance uh, invasion, if you will, of Cecil Sharp and others like him uh, in the early 20th century, focus of tonight's talk. So, when you get interested uh, by tonight's talk, there's more to read. And this is a really good book. I enjoyed it. It's full of pictures. Um, all right, I suppose I should, I should stop doing that. But Danny, I'm excited. What can I say? Um, Danny is, is a historian. He's written several books. And we all know him as a good dancer and enjoyable personality as well. And oh, yes, he's on the CDNY board. So 
I will hand it over to you now, Danny, and uh, you can embarrass yourself instead of having me embarrass you for you, or the other way around. On to you, Danny. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I should begin by thanking Dorothy um, and, and also Daniel Popovich, who also helped to load some of the images you're going to see later tonight. And of course, uh, Helen and Jeff for helping run tonight's program. I want to begin, however, with happy birthday wishes uh, to CDSS. As it happens, in less than five hours, we will be celebrating the 106th anniversary of the founding of the American branch of the English Folk Dance and Song Society, which is the predecessor group really of country dance and song society. And because it also organizes uh, in New York City, it's really the predecessor group really to Country Dance New York as well. And that is, as I say, on the 19th of March. We begin, however, on December, the story for, for tonight begins December 23rd, 1914 the SS Lusitania docked in New York Harbor. Yes, indeed, that's the same boat uh, that a U-boat would sink four and a half months later in May, 1915. It did not get sunk that December, and fortunately, it uh, allowed one of its members, the renowned folklorist Cecil Sharp, to set foot in America. He was the director at the time of the English Folk Dance and Song Society. He had traveled, as many of you must know, to bring ECD to his colonial brethren, and of course, to make a bit of change teaching dance. Less than three months later, on March 19th, 1915, a select group of enthusiasts, country dance enthusiasts, gathered with Sharp for a relatively intimate lunch at a Miss Ware's home in Manhattan, at which the American branch was born. Now, Ware seems to have been the sister-in-law of a local New York dancer, but in a letter to Maud Carpley's, who is Sharp's confidant, collaborator, and secretary, Sharp describes the noteworthy attendees as from Boston. Helen Starro, the Boston Grand Dame, a Harvard professor of drama, George P. Baker, who some of you may know would go on to found the Yale School of Drama, and Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Morris, uh, who represented Wellesley College, where Sharp would later participate. According to Sharp, there were, quote, several unnamed others, presumably representing New York in attendance. But Sharp was not, in fact, the first ECD teacher to grace our shores. Mary Neal, who was variously a collaborator and competitor with Sharp, and uh, his, his teacher, uh, and, and a, one of, one of uh, Mary Neal's um, students, a woman named Flory Warren. So she was a young woman in, in the performance troupe at, uh, at uh, Mary Neal's uh, London settlement. They both came and taught Morris and country dance in the general larger New York and New England area in the winter of 1910 through 1911. And a couple of years later, A. Claude Wright, one of Sharp's demonstration dancers, had rather successful American tours in 1913 and 14. So Sharp was not the first to come. And it should be noted, um, American dance enthusiasts had visited the UK and Sharp. Baker and Starrow had attended Sharp's classes in London and at the Stratford Summer School. And a founding American folklorist, Elizabeth Birchenell, had visited England as part of her early dance collecting trips to Northern Europe at the turn of the century, understanding that she was a folk dance collector and their understanding of the folk was really rooted in white Northern um, areas, Scandinavia, Germany, Eastern Europe and the British, British Isles. Birchnell would later become a leading figure in the New York Public School Athletic League and the Playground Association of America, which I'll turn to a little later, where they would be teaching English and some Scandinavian dances to young girls. Indeed, by 1907, just to give you a sense of what, what had taken place, there were 253 New York City women school teachers teaching over 8,000 girls in 128 city schools. So by time Sharp comes, 1914, 1915, there was already a, a precedent, people who were already here. But context is everything. Why then? What did the dance world for young women and boys look like. Venues 
in filmic adaptations of the Jane Austen books, which we've all seen and loved, we've seen that the central venue from the 19th, early 19th century was the assembly hall in Grand Homes. When Sharp arrives, however, the New York City central venues for social dance are dance halls, nightclubs, and cabarets. The rise of the two-step in the gay 90s gave a new spring to the national dance step, leading society matrons to smart hotels and drawing room classes. The new nightclubs of the urban metropolis epitomized these liminal social dance spaces. In New York, the Follies of 1907 had inaugurated 21 reviews over the next quarter century, produced by Florence Ziegfeld along the lines of the Folies Brugere in Paris. Ziegfeld's Follies displayed Paris Parisian cosmopolitan wickedness and scantily clad young svelte women for bourgeois audiences, not as working class vice. A dance craze, not as performance, but as participation, took hold in New York between 1911 and 1916. And the cabarets removed the boundaries of the theater, encouraging the audience to participate. The dance floor became a staging area in the new cabarets and lobster palaces that seemed to spring up all over New York overnight. By most, by various accounts, there were over 500 dance halls in the city in 1910 and another 100 academies enrolling over 100,000 students in all these wicked ways. Now, one needs to understand before I show you these dances that dancing in the new venues fundamentally challenged the dominant cult of domesticity by which women were supposed to be child bearers, housekeepers, and that was the basis of their femininity. These kind of wild dancing or activities or higher education for that matter were seen as potentially injuring reproductive organs and the emotional stability they believe women needed for motherhood. Heterosocial companionship in the new turn of the century leisure venues, saloons, dance halls, social clubs, Nickelodeons, and amusement parks. For instance, Luna Park opens during this period out in Coney Island. And the word Luna, of course, was meant to reflect the opportunity for madness that could be sanctioned in these liminal spaces. You could go there and be mad and get away with it. You could go into the love canal, love boats, behavior that otherwise might not be appropriate. All of this attracted working girls and middle-class girls, middle class, the middle-class new woman who had otherwise felt constrained by bourgeois Victorian attitudes. These sexualized spaces and engagements without chaperones allowed smoking, flowing liquor, opportunity to be a new woman. The dance craze from 1911 to 1915 otherwise known in terms of the celebration of what was rough dancing, notably in dances such as the Black Bottom in the early 1900s, the Foxtrot, the Cakewalk, Charleston. These were crazes that borrowed from African-American dance, not necessarily just from more formal European steps. Ragtime also stimulated a lot of new dances as Irving Berlin popularized the music with publication of Alexander's Ragtime Band in 1911. And indeed, 1911 to 1913 are the seminal moments just before Sharp arrives. It's when, again, remember that Mary Neal is first here and when Claude Wright is arriving. The major emphasis on these dances was rhythm, not the steps, moving the body in tune to the music. The one step, 1911, also known as the turkey trot with two fourths or four fourths meter and a step for each lively beat was the first and most popular of these ragtime dances in 1911. Let's hear a bit of it, see a bit of it. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. The leading historian really of this period is a woman named Kathy Pice who uh, teaches at the University of Pennsylvania. And she wrote a book which I can recommend heartily to many of you called Cheap Amusements. And in it, she talks about the one dance that uh, was most scandalous to people and it was most popular in a lot of these dance halls, especially among the immigrant and working classes. And it was a dance that was called Spieling, S-P-I-E-L-I-N-G. It was a social dance in which a couple spun around seemingly out of control, a way that it caused, particularly caused sexual excitement because as, 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 as she wrote, of the easy familiarity in the dance practiced by nearly all the men in the way they handle the girls. Now in trying to understand this, I think it's closest probably, and it's the, the word itself suggests some of its German roots, closest to the German immigrant groups and maybe the Spiefacher which as many of you know, alternates pivots and waltz steps. What was indecent about all of this, of course, uh, was what the waltz had scandalized in the middle of the 19th century, that you actually put your arm around somebody else. What the pivoting does, and any of you who, who do Scandia dancing, will, will, this will be familiar to you. Um, I was talking to Dorothy about this a little bit yesterday. We often, in, in trying to pivot quickly with each other, we call it kind of thigh dancing. You have to kind of lock your thighs. The key was to hold your hands around the waist, to pivot, putting your leg between your partner's legs. The, the dizziness and loss of control in this sexualized dance, ah, oh, who knows what might happen. Let's spiel. As you, as you might have guessed by now, that was not Cecil Sharp. And he doesn't look like Cecil Sharp. And it's rather important to have a sense that the people involved in this uh, were, uh, were, were working class and immigrant populations. And that was as scandalous as what they were doing. The dance, of course, that took off and after, uh, for, the, for this uh, rough, rough and tough dancing was the most famous of these was, of course, the Turkey Trot. It is organized in San Francisco in 1909. The excerpt I'm gonna show you is from the, 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 the Jim Dorsey, the, uh, the, the Dorsey dance uh, what, a band in 1947. In the dance, you're supposed to flap your wings like a turkey with one steps, a dance that was described as awkward and simple. Um, and uh, one of the many, what were known as animal dances from the period. Let's see the turkey trot. The dance, however, that's probably most recognized as um, setting this whole craze in motion was the tango. Now, of course, the tango came from Argentina, but it really uh, gets introduced from Argentina into Europe. Uh, many of the Argent Argentines uh, in origins, as many of you know, are from, are from Spain. And the, it makes its way up to Paris. And in 1913, it takes over Paris it's a more sedate version than we associate, in fact, with the intimacy and, and drama of the dance in Argentina or today as we see it, but you'll see something of that drama. But in 1913, a young couple um, goes to Paris and comes back to the United States. It's a couple we'll see, speak of a little later. It's Vernon and Irene Castle. And they arrive in New York they, uh, from Paris with the new dance. 
in this more sedate New York version. They take the city by storm in 1913. It's perceived sexual overtones make it very controversial, ah, but also captivating and enticing. The tango. <laughs> So we move on to the animal dances. Perhaps the one that's most evocative of, the, of, the, of these animal dances, of course, is the grizzly bear, which also bore a relationship to the fox trap. And again, founded in 1910, the version I'm gonna show you is from 1913, though I'm also gonna show you a very short clip after that of a, rec of a recreation of the dance that gives you, a, I think, a more flamboyant version or a, a sense of the grizzly bear. The version you're gonna see is the grizzly bear rag. One description, it's a very heavy step to the side with a decided bending of the upper part of the body from one side to the other, a decidedly ungraceful and undignified movement when performed as a dance, indeed ungraceful, but wickedly fun, the grizzly bear. Other dances, animal dances followed. The monkey in 1911, the crab in 1911. In 1916, it becomes the American crab, a 4-4 ragtime dance. The camel walk, which in 1912 was similar to the stroll of the mid 1950s. The Texas Tommy, a fast pivoting foxtrot with the woman hanging on to the man as in the grizzly bear. And the lame duck, a 1915 ragtime waltz. Waltzing was also popular and it took many different forms. One such waltz that's evocative and gives you a sense of the variations was the airplane waltz from 1914. It was one of many variations, as I've said, this one in three quarter time, but dancing with airplane wings. There were also novelty line ragtime animal dances, the Gabby Glide in 1911, 
The Bunny Hug, 1912, Ball in the Jack in 1913, The Funky Butt, The Chicken Scratch, and a simple two-step, The Snake Dip. Here's an example of one of those, an uh, excerpt, a recreation of the bunny hug, a short little excerpt. I said it was short, alas. Um, there were more exotic dances. Again, understanding here, uh, this was about the celebration of the carnivalesque, sanctioning kind of liminal behavior, uh, and mentioned the ways in which we talked. I talked about when we spoke of uh, uh, the carnivalesque at places like Coney Island. One of those carnivalesque dances was the Maxime from 1914. It's a dance that comes from Brazil, becomes quite popular in the United States, and it then dies out, by the way, after World War I, and it reemerges um, only around World War II, but it reemerges as the Samba. And you'll see something of that in the Maxime from there's a limit to how much we can take of that. It's just <sighs> the institutionalization of this modern ballroom dance with studios, teachers, and this repertoire was illustrated in particular and developed by people we've spoke, a couple I've spoken about earlier who brought the tango over from Paris. And that of course is Irene in Vernon Castle with their particular dance studio and the dance that they most popularized, the Castle Walk. Imagine the Arthur Murray studios basically are the more modern uh, institution that takes over from this or from the, the castle dance studios. And we all benefited from learning those dances probably in seventh or eighth grade dance classes growing up in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. These dances were enormously popular. People flocked at the opportunity to be modern 
and to experience something different with their bodies, and be free. But not all were happy with this kind of dancing. A headline in the New York Times on January 13th of 1913, Wilson banned the ball faring the turkey trot. According to the report, the inaugural committee for Wilson's presidential inauguration was told that the president-elect wanted to cancel the usual inaugural ball because, quote, he feared there would be an indulgence in the turkey trot, the buggy hug, the buggy hug and other ragtime dances, and thus provoke what might amount to a national scandal. The committee agreed to scrap the soiree. His sentiment was quite widely held among certain kind of among certain circles. Jane Adams, perhaps the most progressive era's reformer, uh, Hull House in Chicago from Jane Adams, warned that, in fact, quote from her, there is a canker that the community must eradicate to save its future generations. Now, she wasn't talking about the Chicago machine that mangled, or machines that mangled Chicago's child laborers, or the teeming tenements where the city's endless poor lived and worked. Adams was talking about the dance halls. And here she has an image of women basically going into the dance halls with the assumption that only prostitutes would go to dance halls or women would be led into lives of prostitution. They would have to become loose women. Reformers such as Adams argued that girls and boys had to be taken out of this compromising moral morass of the music hall and given an alternative to the jazz or the animal or the rough dances or this unchaperoned spieling of girls and boys, this wild pivoting. The ballroom, they argued, was the road to hell. This pamphlet, in fact, is from 1894, so it was not an entirely new sentiment. It went back much earlier, but it's simply the, the fears now become increasingly intense and exaggerated. The problem, as these reformers, however, understood, it was both for girls and boys, but it was a problem especially for girls. Playgrounds, settlements, and schoolyards sanctioned competitive team sports for boys in various gymnastic systems and sport for as alternatives. Football, for instance. Um, um, but Henry Curtis, who is a, goes on to found the Playground Association of America warns, it was not boys, but in quoting from him, girls who are our national problem. Man's work, he pointed out, has become more subject to mechanization, but not women's. Girls tend, as he said, to sit about and gossip or pay, play jack straws. He obviously wasn't paying any attention to all the working women who were involved at the, uh, in the garment industry. Vigorous health, he said, and a good physique are always among the chief charms of women and childbirth has become more and more difficult with succeeding generations. The result for women, he warned, is great, greater sterility, dread of childbirth, and less ability to nurse babies. All that dancing put women at risk. And the answer, he argued, is play. But not just any play. Quoting, the school and community need to put very much greater emphasis on play and physical activity for girls, especially during the period before puberty. But again, very much particular kinds of play. Indeed, I should note that a physician Edward H. Clark in 1873 had warned of the emotional and physical dangers to women's reproductive organs of the wrong kind of play and even of schooling. Clark concluded that girls between 14 and 18 years old should not study as much as boys. Young women, he continued, jeopardize their special apparatus when they do too much brain work. At the turn of the century, as the fear of the dance halls and the tango craze began to rise. The general answer for these middle-class and elite reformers, not unlike Sharp, was play and physical activity for girls, especially during the period before puberty. But the more general question applied to both boys and girls frequenting the dance halls, how were immigrant working class immigrant bodies to be disciplined? Could exercise regimes counter the stultifying impersonal character of urban institutions? 
Could they meet the, the needs of workers cooped up all day in factories and tenements? What practices and institutions could revive the spirit of working class girls and boys? So the point is not any play, but proper play. And the answer for that, hope played in the revival of a pure authentic spirit of the race unsullied in rural purity. A revival they had seen represented in the celebration of a merry England, of a rural England of rural purity. And central piece of that was in their mind, folk dancing. Henry Luther Gulick, who was founder of the Campfire Girls, again, instructive like the Girl Scouts, the Campfire Girls were a celebration of rural arts that could be recreated and instilled in people to help them deal with urban morass. He also founds the New York Public School Athletic League that you'll remember Birchanel comes to lead. And he champions their dancing as a bodily discipline as evident in the older folk dancing. No less significant for Gulick, proper bodily discipline, notably absent in industrial cities where working class immigrants were flocking to the dance halls and going out on strikes. But for him, folk dancing provided a lesson in democracy, by which he meant something quite specific. Democracy requires the sandbox for small children, the playgrounds for youths, and quoting him, folk dancing and social ceremonial life for the boys and girls in their teens. And it requires it for, quote, the development of that self-control, which is related to the corporate conscience that has rendered necessary the complex interdependence of modern life. The key word there is self-control, exactly what was lost in all that wild turning in the spieling. Birchnell and the Playground Association of America and the New York Public School Leagues, as a consequence, runs Maypole dancing. And note the white purity of these dresses, young girls with, again, the hundreds of women teachers. And it's worth noting that this kind of teaching and what would become English country dancing would become the cornerstone of initially Columbia University's education training and basically the cornerstone of schools of education in the United States which were primarily schools for the training of young women in elementary and middle school education. Now, rivalists, revivalists like Sharp, in that context, advanced ECD as the purest form of folk dance, as an expression of the pure folk traditions of a simpler past that peasant peoples had left behind, which could now be revived to build an inclusive American identity. It was going in its own ways and it harkens back to something that I think many of you and I will know from our own lives because it's recreated in the 1970s, a back to the land movement or coming out of the 1950s, a precursor of white flight. This in its own way was a kind of white flight from the immigrants and African-Americans and black migration, Northern migration moving into cities. And it's worth noting that immigrants like the Italians and the Jews were generally thought of in the press that I've read as quoting from one Baptist newspaper, not quite white folk altogether. Jane Addams caught the essentially conservative spirit of this new urban liberalism in her own 1909 volume, which she called The Spirit of Youth and City Streets. Quoting from her, these old forms of dancing, which have been worked out in many lands and through long experiences, safeguard unwary and dangerous expression, and yet afford a vehicle through which the gaiety of youth may flow. The unwary, obviously, and dangerous expression were the rough dances. The vehicle would instead be country dance. Their forms are indeed, continuing quoting her, these forms are indeed those which lie at the basis of all good breeding, forms which at once express and restrain urge forward and set limits. That's your dancing body in English country dance. And Sharp's campaign envisioned an American branch that would provide a model and a legacy for the future, an authentic and ennobling folk dance tradition of supple but controlled Edwardian bodies 
in gay but decorous motion. Sharp, in that sense, authorized ECD as an alternative to the dance halls. One that would also avoid the excess of aesthetic dance, of gymnastics, and of other wilder traditions. The American branch was to be specific to English folk dance and a model for other, albeit what he considered inferior folk dance traditions. In 1915, then, Sharp and his coterie would establish a hegemony over the country dance movement, broadly understood as an American, Anglo American tradition that would celebrate white Anglo-Saxon culture, which would speak as much to essential Americanness as to Englishness. The war also became the occasion for his devotees, the Sharpleys, to establish a dance style that would give women teachers a public voice, but in traditional coupled dances, and notably always subservient to Sharp. Sharp liked women as long as they didn't speak up to him. In the settlements, public schools and playgrounds, reforming dance teachers taught these democratic lessons to young men, men and in particular women in how to have respectable bodies. It was to not spiel, it was to come to English country dance. In the teachers colleges and ECD groups, far from the matting immigrant crowd, highly educated white Protestant elites would embody these lessons for themselves and for you and me. The women and men supporting the, supporting the revival in both the United States and England, they also therefore had a class distance, ironically, from their immigrant and peasant subjects from whom they thought they were actually getting many of these dances. The revival dance community constituted, as I've mentioned, a well-heeled coterie of people, most of whom had independent means. They were not like the shirtwaist workers in the garment factories. They had independent means and relatively high status professional careers. In that sense, ECD was a class and a racial project. Took the ritual dances of the working class and the dances from the village green and dressed them up. Sharp often performed them in tie and tucks. It dressed them up in that sense, both literally and figuratively. He reimagined urban space with a reinfusion now of rural piety and purity. One final example worth noting, Henry Ford, who many of you know in the 1930s, goes on to become quite a to, to pioneer in the teaching of folk dance, but also in, in became a rabid anti-Semite, ran the $5 a day program in the Ford Motor Company in the teens, actually exactly at the time we're talking about with Sharp coming. The cornerstone of that was he offered $5 a day to workers. His concern was that the immigrant workers that he had were taking off too much on St. Monday. That was after they went drinking on Sunday. And there was absenteeism and they had a poor work, poor work ethic. He believed he would give them $5 a day and they could continue to earn that, but they had to agree to be under the supervision of his sociological department at the Ford Motor Company. They had to live in his company housing, they had to obey his rules, and they had to go to his school. And they when they graduate from the school, the graduation ceremony was symbolic. They would go in with their ethnic immigrant costumes, go out behind a melting pot, and come out as immigrants Americanized in American dress. English country dance meant to do the same. There you are. Thank you, Danny. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just delighted. I love hearing this history. I love watching the, the crazy videos. I mean, and just the, um, we, we're any society, we're in our own stew of cultural distrust of different aspects. You know, people don't get along and they have these ideas about other class levels and so on. And they had the same thing then. And it, it's really easy to think that a hundred years ago, that people were different from, from now. That, that it's the same, just different. <sighs> the same attitudes around different concepts. It has echoes. There's no question about it. Much of what, much of what you'd see. Um, a lot of the kinds of concerns they had about immigrants uh, were that uh, immigrants weren't in need, immigrants were lazy. 
It's not unlike the kind of dispute debate that you have over welfare and whether welfare, uh, you know, one of the concerns they had is that uh, women shouldn't work. Well, of course, women always had to work and they worked for a long time. They worked going back to the 1830s and they worked well before that. It was unpaid labor. You think living on a farm was easy work? Try carrying buckets of water all day long and doing the work they did. It was always hard work. It was unpaid labor and it was unpaid labor that allowed men to earn a wage. And women, you know, the, the women effectively did the labor both of reproducing the family that would then have children who could go and become the cheap labor in, in, in all these industries, but it also allowed the men to earn a wage. When the women did it, of course, they were paid half of what the men ever earned, and they were expected to hand over the, the paycheck to the men. So they women, created a... Like, women often needed to work for the family, but they also decide, learned that there was a value in work. What did they like about it? There was a little extra money that they could get where they could go and then buy some of the new things they could afford, for instance, to go to Coney Island. They could afford to buy these new shirtwaist dresses. They could afford to buy it to maybe to get on a bicycle and in visit, they could become in their own way, new women. So not so different today. Well, so women had always worked, whether it was paid labor or unpaid labor, but the difference between those two was that one was a social order that the powers that be were comfortable with, they knew what to expect. And the other where um, women, where these immigrant groups had more choices about what to do with their time, decisions to make, well, who knows where that'll lead? That's, that's uncomfortable, that's unknown and unknown is scary. Well, yeah, I, again, it's important to understand that I think English country dance was obviously uh, an exercise routine and a source of great pleasure for a lot of the people who did it, but it was a moral crusade. Um, and that was a that was an element of 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 what drove the people to be doing it. So, all right, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do a big thank you before we move on. Thank you. Oh, I just love this. I um again I um I I pulled up uh, Danny's book before, and it's it's because I he didn't tell me to do this. I really enjoyed this book, and I recommend it. And if you haven't read about all these characters, well, people, but they were characters. I mean, you know, Cecil Sharp, he's a, he's a human being with, uh, with, with lots of opinions and flaws and a man of his time and a man out of his time. Um, anyhow, so um, while um, Helen and Jeff are collecting questions, I've got a couple for you myself, Dan, Danny. Um, and one is uh, about Sharp himself. Now he, um, we revere him for the collecting that he did in the country dance books. And uh, I think many of us are also aware uh, that there were other people conducting the same work at the time. You highlighted a few at the beginning, like uh, Maude Carpolis and, um, oh goodness. Mary, Mary Neal. Mary Neal. Um, but so what were some of the, the, the pros and cons of Sharp? Like how would he stack up today? Um, well, let's, uh, Dorothy. It's, it's easy in a lecture like this to end up feeling that all I've done has been critical about Sharp. He was an extraordinary person and it's much to his credit. This is a guy who uh, was not in the best of health at all and parades through all of uh, the a Appalachian mountains with Maud Carpley, manages to actually uh, extract enormous numbers of stories from people with whom he ultimately got along. He was a, he was a patriarchal person um, he was paternal, I think, uh, paternalizing, but he was with enormous energy and he was sufficiently sympathetic to these people that he developed rapport with them and did an enormous amount of collecting. Uh, he made up stories about these people that he fervently, you know, fervently believed in. He thought he was discovering only in English, uh, English dance traditions. He totally ignored what we many people have written about now for 30 or 40 years about the African-American roots to this, a lot of these dance traditions, the German roots of German immigrants in these background areas. Uh, he was totally oblivious to all of that sort of thing. And he was not very good as I've suggested around gender. It's people may not know, he's a remarkable person. Equally remarkable is his sister. People may not know his sister, Evelyn Sharp is one of the leading suffragists, suffragettes in England. She goes on hunger strikes in England and she is force fed while in jail. And Sharp has almost nothing to do with her. 
He was not very sympathetic. And when he was later invited in 1917 and 18 to lecture at Wellesley College, he agreed to do so as long as the women of that stripe kept their distance from him. So he was not very good. It's, a, yeah, it's important to remember that we're talking about a period in which suffrage is very much on the agenda as well. And suffrage, and he's not very good about that. And I've mentioned some of these people like Birchnell and Mary Neal. Um, Sharp does not treat these people very nicely at all. He really, uh, and, and in, in some sense, uh, in doing so, it meant that the ways in which the dance might have looked differently if they had become more dominant shaped the kind of dancing that we came to know. So Mary Neal was involved, um, for instance, in working with her settlement house girls and it was a much more flamboyant dancing step that she would have done. And, it's, and, she, and she was much more willing to allow the dance to take the form that the dancers would give it. Sharp was very much um, believed that he understood how the dancing should be done and people should do it his way. And so it, and it became a certain kind of formalistic way. I think in some ways uh, there were efforts to break with some of that by Douglas Kennedy, uh, one of Sharp's original dancers in the, in the collecting of the community dance manuals. So it was really to, to make as an integral part of the country dance tradition, country dances that were traditional dances. So for a long, we, we often in this country have come to see English country dance as play for dancing. But of course it wasn't, and it isn't in England to this day. It's as much country dancing that come, that celebrated in all those community dance manuals. We do very few of those dances nowadays, almost none. Uh, as early as, as late as the 70s, I know Beverly Francis discussed this with me when I, when I was teaching English country dance a decade, two decades ago, the dancing in the 70s in New York would have been a mixture of uh, contra dance, English, traditional dance, and play for dancing all in the same evening. And that's frankly what it looks like at, uh, or look like quite often at Cecil Sharp House in the dancing in England until recently. So we've developed, as it were, our own style, and in some ways, Sharp is responsible for that. You know, you mentioned uh, Douglas Kennedy and the Community Dances Manual, and of course I'm aware of it, I use it, but I hadn't thought of it as a kind of revolutionary breaking out publication, which it sounds like it was, you know, breaking out of the, the, the ordained Cecil Sharp mode. That's, well, that's a new uh, perspective. Sharp had done some of that work himself quite early. This was not new to him. He had done that actually. He started collecting some of the traditional dances, I think in 1904, 1905 or seven, really before he, before he turns to the play for dances. Uh, so he knew about some of that, but it all got, a lot of it got lost and it got lost in the dance tradition. Um, and what got replaced increasingly in our own dance tradition, and I think it's partially, you know, the, the book that you talked about, it's not really just about the turn of the century. It, it tries, I try to take the story around into the 21st century. And I would argue that the dance tradition after the 80s and 90s has become a what I call um, modern English country dance. It's almost a different kind of dance tradition, which has become almost entirely play for dance. Before that, it was a, it was a much, it, it encompassed a much broader repertoire than it, than it does now. I see that some questions are coming in. Um, Helen, can I get you to pose some of those? Yeah, this has been a wonderful talk, Danny, and people have been stimulated in a variety of ways. Um, I think one of the earliest came from Chip, who I see is still here. And by the way, I will call on you if you've submitted questions in the chat. And if you don't want to um, say them yourself, give me a heads up and I will uh, read them for you. But Chip, you gonna ask? Yeah, um, so, <clears throat> One, one of the things, whenever I hear about English country dancing and the times that it started, I also think of Scottish country dancing. And I remember I used to think that Scottish, that Miss Milligan, you know, Jean Milligan, who started all that, was went way back to the 19th century sometime. And I was surprised to discover that she really got it going in uh, Glasgow in about 1923 or something like that. And I'm curious to know whether she, like Sharp, found herself um, having to, you know, whether, whether, and I don't know whether you know the answer to this or not, I, I, I'm guessing you might, uh, whether she also found herself having to fight against the encroachment of these scandalous partner dances at, at you know, her time. 
Chip, that's a good question. The person who actually ought to be able to answer that better than I, I think is was on, in, and that would be Stephanie, Stephanie Smith, um, who actually studied and did her degree in, in Scotland. And I'm guessing that Stephanie might know the answer to that. Oh. Stephanie? Do I, I don't really know the specific answer to that question, but I do know that she was a, alive and kicking and teaching fairly late into the 20th century because my PhD supervisor had taken classes with her in Glasgow. I, I read that she died in, in her 90s in 1978 or something like that, which is so much later than I ever would have guessed. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. I guess the one thing I, that I would say, uh, Chip, that's interesting in relationship to Sharp, is that we, we would say that Sharp is inventing and reinventing English country dance, as we all are all the time inventing it. But, but Scottish dance is wholly invented out of whole cloth, whereas, whereas Sharp is going back and looking at dances from the 17th, you know, 16th and 17th century dances that have a tradition in the village green and in Renaissance dancing. She's really, as I understand it, wholly inventing out of whole cloth, a whole new dance tradition. It really starts de novo in the 1920s. Unlike Sharp is looking back at that dance tradition and trying to interpret it. And all interpretations are, are reinventions. Hers is a total invention in a sense that, her, that his is a reinvention. Is that right, Steph? Well, I, I would say that there, the, the real is, is an old dance yes, sure. and there are many forms of it. Pat Shaw collected um, Shetland reels. Um, <laughs> and so I, I- A good point, yeah. Yeah, but I think in a way you can look at the two of them as shaping these dance forms. You know, I, that's kind of the way I look at it. In her case, the way I see it is that not only, you know, were the dances themselves very carefully and specifically laid out, uh, but that just the whole atmosphere, the whole uh, way of teaching, the methods of teaching, the language to be used, and the way the musicians are trained was all so very, very specific. Um, much more so than in, uh, you know, almost any other dance tradition that I'm aware of. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's why I didn't do Scottish country dancing when I was in Scotland. <laughs> I went to the, the more traditional dances where they just did various popular country dances. Are, are you aware at all that she was, um, that, that she might have been, you know, uh, reacting to couple dancing, or do you think she was just on her own path? I, I don't know that much about her. Um, you know, what I do know is that she was teaching at, uh, I, I think, would it be Jordan Hill College of Physical Education or something in Glasgow? Um, so it was associated with the physical education side of things. That, oh. that much I do know. Well, thank you. Um, sure. Claudia Thanks. also had an interesting question about the relationship of Sharp and the revival to the temperance movement. Claudia, you want to take it from there? Well, I was just reminded of it with the kind of the anti-immigrant thing and, and the control of the body and the idea of healthy bodies and all that. I was just wondering, were any of these people, Cecil Sharp or others, temperance people? Was there any overlap with that movement? Not, 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 that, I've, not that I've seen anything of it. No. Hmm. Generally, generally, these people, you know, looked, looked uh, frowned upon um, other people drinking rather than themselves. <laughs> and Carl had a question about the sanitization of uh, dancing. Um, so I was just wondering, Chip and I were both commenting on the fact that square dancing uh, was also used um, sort of to proselytize this idea of a pure American dance form, pure white American dance form is over and against uh, immigrant or black culture, even though, of course, its roots were far from that. 
So I was wondering, and I know there are different routes for English country dance. I'm wondering to what extent you think Sharp reinvented or redefined ECD to fit his own purposes. You know, Carl, part of the part of the trickiness with all of that is the term a uh, square dance in all of this, because there are two very different square dance traditions. The, the tradition that really relates to ECD is the tradition that comes out of the Southern mountains and the New England mountains. And it's what we associate with, uh, with contra dance, which involves both line dancing and squares. And that's quite different from the modern square dance movement. Um, one, just to give you an example, if you do a, uh, an ethnography of the two groups, you'll find that the, that the, the, that the contra dance community tends to be uh, young people who are pretty progressive back to the land folks. Um, and many coming out of the 70s, for instance, were, 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 were hippies and elsewhere. If you go to the, uh, to, this, to the modern square dance movement, you'll find that you're talking about um, conservative, uh, Christ, Christian conservatives in, in, uh, in, Oklahoma, in Oklahoma. And they, they bear, there's almost entirely no relationship between these communities whatsoever. So I'm not sure which of these groups you're actually mean to be talking about, Carl. So, so what I'm saying is this, square dancing before both of those, I mean, both of those traditions came out of a similar tradition. And I think the modern Western square dance tradition was to some extent what came, came about when square dancing was taken uh, by people who, social reformers, who wanted to create a movement that was a pure American dance form as counterposed to um, other dance forms that were lower class or more multi-ethnic. Uh, so I'm wondering to what extent if, so, so to the extent, I'm just drawing a parallel, forget mm -hmm. that for a minute. I'm asking with ECD, Cecil Sharp, you're saying used it also um, to sort of sanitize, you know, as an effort to sanitize or homogenize the culture in a way that was non-ethnic. And I'm wondering, or was somehow more proper uh, than other forms of dance. And I'm wondering to what extent you think that's true to the roots of ECD, or if Cecil Sharp and others took a dance form and somehow transformed its, its meaning or origins to fit their social purposes. I think Sharp transformed it. I think the revival largely transforms it and, they're, and they're, it's their obsession, uh, not with sanitizing, is really about social order, creating a social, creating social order. So, that, you know, it, it's, you know, again, worth remembering that the, the young women who are the shirtwaist the shirt the, the shirt workers we're talking about are also uh, in, you know, in exactly the years we're talking about, 1909 through 1913, involved in, in the, uh, the strike of the t uh, you know of twenty thousand, there you know there and and then the Triangle Shirtwaist fire and the demonstrations after that, and these are all these are socialist women. So his con I think their concerns have a kind of large political agenda. It's complicated because Sharp is, is is his own way is a Fabian socialist, but he's but he's a Fabian socialist with real imperial with real imperial ambitions and imperial you know ties to all of that. So he was also a member of the Navy League. So he, you know, and it's worth remembering, this is a period in which uh, both in England and the United States and Germany and a lot of these other countries that are involved in this, all in this folk revival are also deeply engaged in imperialism. And that's a colonial project. And, and in many respects, I would argue that English country dance is a domestic colonial project. Interesting. You. Lynn Feynman had a question about Sharp's response in particular to dances of the time. Lynn, are you here? I am. Uh, hi. Hi, Lynn. Hi, cousin Danny. Hi, cousin Lynn. Um, so um, when you were a um, uh, you dedicated a big bunch of your presentation to the couple dancing that was popular at the time before um, Sharp came over and started to do his thing here. But I don't know whether I maybe missed something um, or if there's something where you could say um, 
um, to address whether he was aware of this kind of dancing, what he thought of it, what he felt about it. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's social dancing generally, rather than um, and just couple, this was what was popular social dancing. Um, you know, in his own notebooks, the dancing he talks about uh, mostly is actually, and he's most concerned about, to be honest, in his daily writings um, are, is aesthetic dancing. That's to say, um, ballet, modern dance. Um, he's not at all happy with that, and he finds it deeply problematic when he goes to try to teach these women that they all want to, you know, fluff their hands around. And we still see it in our, you know, in our in our dance floor. New new dancers come in, and they've grown up doing ballet, and they end up wanting to do ballet with English country dance. And Sharp was, you know, worked hard to try to get that out of their bodies and get them to understand what the body carriage was. And the body carriage for him was constrained, upright with a kind of his gay simplicity. So it moved forward. It was, he wasn't, a, he, wasn't a, 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 he wasn't without movement in his body as you've seen from a lot of the dance, from some of the dancing and the images that they have of Sharp, but it was meant to be a restrained gay simplicity. Yeah, days. you said that Neil was, that Neil's uh, settlement house workers were much more flamboyant uh, and Sharp's more restrained, but looking at those, you know, those angles of some of the dancing of Sharp's pupils, they didn't look very restrained. <laughs> well, they were, they were, no, they had a lot of forward movement, but look at their arms and look at their, their, their arms are at their sides. Yeah. They're not out flapping. Their legs are, so what Sharp was concerned about is the other girls were flapping their legs. They were kicking up their legs. <laughs> It's not unlike when we have when we see up a double and some of our dancers start throwing up their legs on up a double rather than bringing their feet together and back and forth and sharp, um, you know that that's the the difference. And this is a, a minor point, but Christina is asking. I think it was right after the clip from was it Pig Musketeers, um, one of the early dances that you showed. I think there were two kinds of dance in the, the clip, same yeah. film. She wanted to know what movie that was from. You know, I, I, I don't remember. I don't remember offhand. Almost all of these clips are can be found on YouTube, but they're part of the Smithsonian collection, and they are all kind of available. You do kind of do a search for them. Okay. Um, and I think there was one. Oh yes, and Hara asked about how May Gad fits into to Sharp's program. <laughs> um, you know, Sharp was very careful about bringing over women he had trained um, who, and who lionized him, and Maygad was such a person. She was a, a devotee. Never, never a, a bad word was to, of Sharp was to, was to pass, her, pass her lips, and I think it was felt it was only after she retired that it became possible. It, it's, it's, it's probably not totally coincidental that the dance community kind of opens up after she retires at the same time in the, in the 70s as a new generation of people come to the dance community and Pat Shaw arrives, who himself was quite prepared to challenge at least some of those traditions. Would have been harder for her, for him to do that if she was still around probably before that. That's my guess. Jean might have a better sense of that than I, since he was around. <laughs> Sounds right. So I, have we have we gone through the questions that are I in the, think the we chat have. so far? If anybody else has a, a burning question, then please put it in the chat now, because I think I've gotten through all, all of them. That I don't have so much a question, but as a, a, a comment, uh, Danny, early in your talk, you mentioned um, uh, keeping women down. What? And one thing you said in passing was, you know, higher education for women was, um, was, was, was a, was a, a dangerous path. And it hit me because, uh, that is an attitude that certainly was in middle-class America for a long time. And probably is still around in certain corners. My mother, just to give some context, my mother was born in 26. So when I was growing up, uh, there was a 
Irish Catholic family down the street, uh, five kids. And when the youngest was of an age, uh, the mother went back to college, went to school, got a degree, got her master's degree, was, uh, became a teacher. My mother was fretting about this the whole time. And sure enough, the divorce, the family split up and it, you know, just solidified in her mind, uh, the horrors of a woman getting an education. And uh, some, you know, 25 years later, my sister went back to college, got her master's degree, became a teacher. Her marriage fell apart. And, you know, more proof that if you educate a woman, look what happens. Of course, what, what, what they missed was if, if they were given the freedom to begin with and weren't trapped in those marriages at the start of their young adulthood, those marriages wouldn't have happened because they were different people. Well, women, um, until, until quite recently, women were expected to go to college to find husbands if they went to, if they went to university at all. And they were taught at certain you know, elite schools of, of Bryn Mawr or Sarah Lawrence, how to make tea and how to ride horses. That changed. And you know, higher education for women was fairly limited uh, and, until, uh, the 19, until 1960, until roughly the late 50s. The, when I was in, in, college, in high school at, in New Jersey in the late 50s, almost all the young women, if they went to college, went to teachers' colleges. And most of them are, we now know as university, Montclair State University was Montclair State Teachers College. Patterson was Patterson State Teachers College. That's where the women went and the men went elsewhere with a whole range of different expectations. And it's only when that all changes that not only does their life change, but so does the notion of what is in education. So it's instructive that if you were to look today at women's studies programs, labor studies programs, urban studies programs, ethnic studies programs, they are all created in the late 1960s after those people first go to colleges and say, where are we in that curriculum? Where are our stories and start insisting on that? And so the whole notion about not simply how they're trained, but what it means to be educated in the nature of the corpus is transformed um, in, in the 60s by their, by their very presence. Mm -hmm. So 